Richard Case Miguel was indeed very, very important. First of all, I, the reason I took him seriously was that on September 20th of 1963, two months before the assassination, Miguel had walked into a bank in El Paso, Texas, uh, asked a teller for $100 uh, in American Express traveler's checks, turned around, fired two holes into the ceiling, walked outside and intentionally got himself placed in federal custody. Now, the FBI had seized that day from him a number of things, including uh, two notebooks, only one of which ever surfaced again. And uh, that notebook, which I saw, contained remarkably similar listings to what had been in Oswald's notebook. So this convinced me that this was a guy worth tracking down if I could, and I had an address for him, Manhattan Beach, California, just outside L.A. I went there and knocked on that door one day. Um, he was always very cagey in the sense of there was only so much he would reveal, but we had this, you know, on again, off again relationship for a long time, and I waited for years, 17 years, to write the book, the first book, The Man Who Knew Too Much, because I was hoping that he would one day, you know, decide to tell me everything, but he never did. Uh, was there a sense of danger in the air? Could you tell that there were people around that were spying on you? Sometimes. I knew one night I was being followed, shadowed, over the car behind me. Now, just to paint a full picture of Nigel, he was a pivotal figure in the JFK story. Uh, at that time, he was a CIA agent and he was also being dangled as a double agent for the KGB. Is that correct? But yeah, Nagel was a, a double agent put to work by the CIA in the uh, summer of 62, right before the Cuban Missile Crisis, was sent to Mexico City based on his previous contacts in Japan. He had a history where he could connect up with Soviet intelligence there and uh, what he described as a disinformation campaign at the time. He was feeding them I guess, false information about the missile crisis situation. He was given two assignments when he left Mexico City in the fall of 62 by the Russians. They'd gotten wind, the Russians that is, of a plot to assassinate President Kennedy by a group of Cuban exiles um, operating out of Mexico City initially, uh, anti-Castro Cubans, and they wanted him to keep an eye on that. And they also wanted him to keep an eye on a young guy who had defected to Russia, supposedly, and just returned to the United States and was living in Texas, and that guy's name was Lee Harvey Oswald, completely independent at that time of uh, any assassination plot against President Kennedy. And he had run across Oswald earlier in his life in the military when he was stationed in Japan. Yes, they had what he described, what Nagel described as a casual but purposeful acquaintance in, uh, in Japan. How did Nagel portray Oswald and the role he was playing in the run-up to the assassination? What does he say about who Oswald really was? He says that Oswald was involved, was brought into, not until the summer of 63, by these two anti-Castro Cubans who were posing as Castro agents. And they convinced Oswald that if he took part in some fashion in this uh, uh, plot against President Kennedy, because Castro's life had been threatened by the administration, by the CIA, you know, this was retaliation, but but that Oswald would be welcomed in Cuba as a revolutionary hero. He was the necessary patsy, the, the necessary ingredient, because he lived in Russia. He had ties uh, to Castro's Cuba through the Fair Play for Cuba Committee and so on. Even if it was set up by the FBI, he had those ties on paper. So Miguel's assignment was then to either uh, convince Oswald he was being set up, that this was a phony deal, or uh, to kill him in Mexico City in uh, September of 63. What happened then was rather than do this, rather than kill him, that is, Nigel sent a warning letter, a registered letter to J. Edgar Hoover, the head of the FBI, in September of 63, September between the 13th and the 17th of September. Then he uh, also alerted his superiors at the CIA, including Desmond Fitzgerald, and uh, walked into a bank after that and took himself out of the picture by uh, getting himself arrested. He presumed that the U.S. agencies would take some kind of action. Just, he said he, he gave enough information in, in his letter, morning letters, especially the one to Hoover, I, I saw uh, quoted from, I never saw the original letter, that, or a copy of the original letter that Nagel had, but that letter certainly gave enough information to warrant the arrest of Oswald and these two Cuban exiles who used uh, the code names Angel and Leopoldo. Miguel would never tell me their real name. That's interesting. Well, he obviously felt that that was too big a secret to let out. Yeah, I think so. And, he, and 
you know, he was trying to stay alive too. He he had when he after he walked into the bank, he was tried twice actually and convicted twice for quote attempted bank robbery. Well, there was no way even the arresting police officer Jim Bundren said, you know, this guy wasn't trying to rob the bank. But uh, a couple curious things about his case, which also lend I think a lot of credibility to his story. One is the police officer I interviewed twice to him. He was a very young cop at the time in, in El Paso on the, on the force. And uh, he told me that I think three weeks before the assassination, November 4th of 63, that there was a preliminary hearing in Miguel's trial. And that the cop, Bundren, looked at him and said, you didn't, you didn't really try to rob that bank, did you? And Miguel said, no, oh, you're a pretty smart cop, aren't you? And then Miguel said, well, I'll just tell you this. I'm very glad not to be in Dallas right now. That the police officer, of course, remembered this and then told me this. You know, he'd lived with it for years and years, never talked about it. Um, that was one very strong piece of evidence supporting that Miguel was who he said he was, as much as he would say. And the other interesting thing that happened was that uh, in January of 64, before there was ever a, a jury selected or anything, uh, a new judge was brought into Miguel's trial. Bam, all overnight. That judge's name was Homer Thornberry, who was a very close confidant and friend of Lyndon Johnson's. In fact, he was uh, in Texas when Johnson became president that day that Kennedy was assassinated. So, and, and Thornberry immediately put a lid on anything that Miguel tried to bring up that would even hint at a, you know, anything about the Kennedy assassination. It was, you know, there was some interesting stuff. Also CIA people, it's on record, came to visit Miguel in jail. And uh, he, he served four and a half years for something that he never even set out to do. And, and then he gets out of prison in April of 68, immediately shows up in East Germany. This guy was released at the, at the border by, in a high-level uh, prisoner deal. And it was Nigel, you know, who, but nothing was said about the bank incident in Texas, none of that. It was just, here was this guy, former military captain, you know, who had been held captive or held behind the then called Iron Curtain for, uh, you know, four and a half months. So what was going on? I mean, the guy clearly was not just some uh, flunky off the street. With his relationship to Oswald, he was sort of stalking him, keeping an eye on him in New Orleans then the summer before the assassination. And then at a certain point, he has these orders to either convince Oswald to get away from these conspirators or to kill him. Right. And who's giving him the orders? The Russian. At least it seems to be the Russian. You know, who's who? And, and Nigel later became very, during this period, became very suspicious that his CIA case officer or somebody he was reporting to in CIA was actually an agent for the Russians himself. The Russians for their own good reasons. I mean, one, they didn't want the assassination to be pinned falsely on them. They had enough connections in, on this whole inside world, uh, you know, that that could happen. Ironically, uh, not the Americans, but the Russians who set out to try to prevent this from happening. We have a real left trail with Oswald, and then there's Guy Bannister, and this whole got David Ferry end of it, and that feels very right-wing. Yes, and Oswald was connected to those guys. There's no doubt about it. I mean, Nigel said that too, you know, that Ferry was involved with Oswald, so was Bannister. So, you know, are we ever going to sort it out? I doubt it. I mean, <laughs> But um, one thing about Nigel, he came back, or you came back in com conversation and contact with him around the time of the ARRB? It was very, very strange. Um, I waited many years, as I said, to go ahead and publish uh, The Man Who Knew Too Much, which was a pretty, it was about, about more than Miguel. It was all the people I'd interviewed and, you know, all the pieces I'd put together. So that book came out in 1992. And prior to that, I had tried very hard to kind of recontact Miguel and say, hey, you know, I'm writing this book. I'm finally going to do it. Is there, will you talk to me some more? Uh, he never responded. And uh, then the next thing that happens is, I guess a year and a half or two has gone by after the book came out. And one day I'm in my office and I get a phone call and I pick it up and it's him. We start to, and he, he, the conversation picks up really as if no time has passed. I mean, you know, he doesn't mention the book. And finally I say, well, Dick, you, you do realize, you do know that I've published this huge book that's mostly about you. He says, no. I said, well, I wrote you all these letters and to tell you that I was doing this. And he said he never received any of them. So clearly someone was still, you know, tampering with his mail. And... 
we, would, would you meet with me again? And, and he said he would. And then he didn't, and later said he was told not to contact me or not to meet with me when I was out in California. So in 1995, then, um, I was giving the paperback of the book had come out. I was giving a lot of talks here and there, and I was in, I'd been in touch with the Assassination Records Review Board, and I was trying to convince them, you know, this guy is worth paying attention to. You should, uh, I'd always believed if Nigel was subpoenaed by an official government agency, that he would probably talk if someone took him that seriously. And unbeknownst to me, they then decided we are going to go after Miguel. They sent a, a subpoena to him, to his P.O. box in Los Angeles. And the day that subpoena arrived in his mailbox, he was found dead in his house. Mm. So then his son, the review board, flew immediately out to Los Angeles. The police sealed off the house. And the review board went in with his son and went through some went through what was there. It wasn't a whole lot, but there was a uh, there were keys to uh, a series of foot lockers that he kept. Nigel kept in uh, I believe it was Tucson, Arizona. And uh, Nigel had always said that there was one trunk in particular, the purple trunk, that contained what everybody wanted to know about. So the son flew to Tucson. Uh, while the son was gone in Tucson, his apartment was broken into in San Diego and, oh. and uh, left a mess. Um, and when he got there, there was only one trunk missing, and that was the purple trunk. So what happened, I believe to this day that even though the autopsy that was done on Miguel indicated a, uh, a heart attack by natural causes, you know, people know how to induce heart attacks, and it's quite... Uh, probable in my mind that somebody uh, had him killed before he would potentially have talked to the Assassination Records Review Board. And somebody also did away with the purple trunk and broke into the, his son's apartment. And somebody is whoever, I don't know. I could only speculate about that. But one thing about Nagel, there's a recording that he did supposedly that kept him alive. And that may be one of the things he was moving around in that trunk. And the can you tell us a b little bit about what that recording would be all about? Yeah. Uh, apparently, he, he said that um, late in August of 1963, he surreptitiously tape-recorded a meeting, conversation among, I guess it was four or five people, talking about assassinating President Kennedy. So Miguel had this tape, and he called it one of his pieces of life insurance, he didn't want that tape uh, to surface because he knew if it did, he would be uh, probably not with us much longer. Nagel is actually referenced in the JFK movie. Uh, I know Fletcher Prouty is supposed to be Mr. X, but the actual meeting took place with Garrison and Mr. X. is based on Garrison meeting Nagel. How did that go? Or how did that come about? I know the Garrison investigation is 67. Garrison uh, went to New York, and this was right after Nagel got out of prison. By the way, he was just suddenly let go. He's suddenly free. It's April 68. Garrison meets him in Central Park. They walk around, talk, I think, for a couple of days. At any rate, Garrison did write about Miguel in his, one of his books. And, uh, and Garrison told me, as did Fensterwald, the attorney, that they both felt that Miguel was, as of 19, the mid-70s, when I interviewed Garrison a couple of times, he said, Nigel's the most important living witness there is, if somebody could get him to tell everything he knows. And then uh, Nigel ended up, after that, going to Europe and, as I mentioned earlier, being taken off a train in East Germany and held for four months, uh, probably not just in East Germany, but in Russia, uh, the Soviet Union. And he told me uh, that he had actually handwritten a quote confession, you know, telling everything to the Soviets of why he did what he did, why he walked into the bank, what his, what his choices were in that uh, period in September of 63. One thing I find fascinating is that Nigel talked about someone named Leon Oswald, who was in the New Orleans period with Oswald, shadowing him, uh, pretending to be him, doing this Oswald impersonation yeah. Did he go any further with that? Um, Not much. He just said there was a second Oswald. He used the name Leon. One thing he did indicate was that this second Oswald was killed, murdered by mistake. In other words, maybe somebody who thought it was Lee Harvey Oswald around the 19th of September, 63. Uh, 
that sort of Maybe thing. Maybe Nigel didn't do it. Somebody else, you know, went ahead and did it thinking that they got the wrong guy. So we have a lot of this uh, name shifting with Oswald and his military records. You go into that quite a bit. You refer to the possibility of a second Oswald, not just someone impersonating him, but someone who actually was groomed from a very young age to be an Oswald double, uh, following his footsteps throughout his life, create these conflicting accounts. Um, yeah, that indicates, that, and it certainly is known that you know there, that the whole double idea operation was used by intelligence services of both the U.S. and the Russians, and uh, and that it could sometimes have begun when someone was very young. In other words, you know, they're grooming these kids to, for certain roles, and they look alike, and you know, you, you know, lookalikes have a lot of uses in the intelligence world. Sure. So. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and I, I made some calls, too, when I was in touch with John Armstrong in the mid-90s. I mean, you know, I called the principal of Stripling Junior High where one of the Oswalds went. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told me that the day of the assassination, uh, the FBI swept down on the junior high and demanded everything, demanded to have anything they had on, uh, on Oswald. And it was so sudden that he was kind of taken aback by it. You know, why are they so, why, why is that the first thing anybody wants? So This is junior it, high, right? Junior high. Is this yeah. evidence of... Uh, <laughs> Some kind of cover up with pictures and so on of you know a, a double Oswald. I mean, it seems that way. Yeah. Uh, but John Brown's book uh, Harvey and Lee goes into this in great detail for any of your listeners who are interested. I think it's very interesting because there is this evidence after he was killed that even the Secret Service were confused about his identity and were trying to track down. And at some point, you mentioned in your book that. In 64, this, the original idea of exhuming him came up in 64, even though it happened many years later. Yeah, it did, because uh, they weren't sure. You know, was, this, was there a Harvey Oswald? Was there a Lee Oswald? Were there two of them? One day I came across this, this card, which was an Oswald ID card uh, that was somehow Nagel had. And it had never before appeared in public. And, and it was a uniform services military identification card with a photograph of a different signature than the card that was known to exist, which was only seen one time. And that card, the card in the book, had a Department of Defense overstamp on it, but Nigel's did not. Huh. So obviously he's connected to Oswald somehow in order to get a copy of a card with no overstamp. Was the picture of Oswald, I know you reproduce uh, the picture in your book, do you think it's possible that Nigel was identifying himself as Oswald? No, not I don't believe so, but I think he was identifying him. What he told me about the Heidel alias, all he would say was that a lot of people were using the name Heidel. And he listed Heidel as one of his own aliases. What that meant, I don't know. I mean, once I, I raised the possibility with him that I might have figured it out, which was that H-I-D, the first part of it, those were the, the initials for the South Korean intelligence agency, the predecessor of the South Korean CIA, for whom Nega had worked or been involved with in the mid-50s in Japan. And I said, an ELL, well, those are the last three letters of your own name. Well, he kind of blanched when I said that uh -huh. and, you know, refused to make any comment. He was trying to tell you something about Oswald without actually <laughs> saying it all. But in your own work on Oswald, how do you see Oswald now that you've gone through all the research, you've had these experiences? What is your opinion of Lee Harvey Oswald and the way he's, he's portrayed as the lone assassin, of course, in popular culture? But you've researched it. How do you actually see who this man was? Well, I certainly don't believe he was the lone assassin. I'd, and I don't even know if he fired a shot. I mean, there's a lot of evidence that he didn't. And uh, I think he is and remains uh, one of history's greatest enigmas. You know, he's 23 years old, and look at all he had done, done in his life, you know, and, and from the time he was a kid, and all these associations he had on both sides. I mean, I think he was the perfect patsy. I mean, they needed him to pin it all on in order to, number one, you know, do the cover-up. I mean, I don't think the Warren Commission, with the exception of somebody like Alan Dulles, who was a pretty evil guy. Yeah. Uh, um, but certainly not Earl Warren and, and Richard Russell and some of the other people on the Warren Commission. I mean, uh, you know, they, they weren't doing this because uh, they were covering up uh, what they, uh, you know, for some various reason. I think they were sincerely trying to um, 
keep us out of World War III. I think they had been told that, you know, if, we, if this is pursued, we're going to find out that Oswald had these direct ties to Castro and the Cubans and, you know, before that to the Russians and, and that they were involved in assassinating our president. What are we going to do? You know, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to go to war. Did you come to any conclusions about Ruby and if Ruby knew Oswald? Yeah, I think that it's quite likely Ruby knew, knew Oswald. There's a lot of people who say that Ruby and Oswald were acquainted. You had a uh, very interesting interaction with a gentleman named Philip Corso, who's retired military intelligence. What did he tell you? He had worked as, a, as an investigator for Senator Russell. He'd been gathering whatever material information he could find and reporting to Russell. And Russell, by the way, was one of, he was the main guy on the Warren Commission who came out and he wouldn't sign the report. He said, you know, there was a conspiracy, basically. And, and Corso was talking to him about this double Oswald thing, that uh, there had been two Oswalds. And one of them went into Russia and a different one came back to the United States. So, and they were lookalikes. So again, you had this kind of, you know, scenario that John Armstrong writes about being talked about in a different context and that there was a whole thing about Oswald's passport once he ended up in Russia, which Hoover was very concerned about. We know from the official record the FBI was, had said in 1960, we are concerned that an imposter may be using Oswald's passport in Russia. Yeah, I and mean, that's documented fact. You know, it's just endlessly, uh, it's a rabbit hole. You start going down it and you don't know quite if you're ever going to reach the center of the earth. I mean, it's I think that was by design. I think whoever, and that's the other reason I thought Willoughby could have been involved because he was a genius. You know, he was a master of this kind of manipulation and spy games, or Dulles too, you know, for that matter. Well, you know, we'll never know who really killed President Kennedy until they release all the dossiers in, in Russia, Minsk, and. But there, if if there is any real sort of evidence that links Oswald to the CIA, um, you did so much work on Antonio Vesiana. And, of course, on the 50th anniversary, he came out and said that David Atlee Phillips was Maurice Bishop, his case officer, and that he met him with Oswald in September 63. Uh, how do you feel about that kind of revelation? I mean, I always thought that Maurice Bishop was Phillips, and I, I met with Fiatiana several times. met him at the Trailways bus station in Miami, and, and we sat down in a cafe, and uh, he said, reveal this incredible story, which was that, you know, he'd had this, he'd been involved in all these plots to kill Castro. He had a CIA case officer he called Bishop, who, you know, was called, called into a meeting in August of 63 and had Oswald there at the meeting and this young guy who said nothing, but obviously was connected to him somehow. Uh, he was telling this story at the same time to Gaten Fonzi of the uh, House Select Committee investigator who lived in Miami and was, and, and I, I happened to be staying with Gaten at the time in Miami but Vichiana said, you can't tell Gaten that I'm talking to you about this. So it was kind of a little bit awkward, you know. I mean, I, I didn't. And uh, I sat on this story. I, he told me if I published this, you know, his life could be in danger. And I respected that. So I didn't do anything. And then all of a sudden in 76, at some point, Jack Anderson did a column, syndicated national column, uh, about a Mr. X, you know, coming out in the Kennedy assassination. And that was... Obviously, to anybody who in the know, that was Vecchiano. And then I think it was 1979, he was uh, shot outside that same trailways bus station, shot in the head. But he did survive and uh, lived to a ripe old age and did on his deathbed uh, talk about David Phillips as having been uh, his case officer, therefore having been connected with Lee Harvey Osmond. And, you know, uh, really wanted to... Uh, the truth to be revealed so that this country could, our country could move on, you know, from uh, a place that I don't think we've ever really recovered from, which was 50 years ago now. But I think once something of that magnitude happens and it's, it's basically the truth is not told about it, that colors everything that has happened ever since, you know, and through uh, the, into the situation we've got today with uh, the surveillance state that we live in post 9-11 and, and, uh, you know, the NSA revelations and, and the gridlock in Congress where nothing can get done. I mean, we called back in the 60s. And uh, for the four great leaders, um, starting with JFK and then Malcolm X, and Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy, were all gunned down. And with them, I think, went a lot of not just hopes, but chances for real change the way a lot of my generation, at least, and others, too, envisioned could come to pass back then. 
and you do feel you can feel the threads of that JFK cover up going through the 70s and Watergate and uh, sort of the 80s Iran Contra and coming along right up through 9-11. And it's almost like all that stuff grew up and here we are in the middle of it. If we could understand the JFK as sort of a one of the turning points in history, we'd understand this kind of militarized, centralized state that we're, we're starting to live in more and more since 9-11. It's a great tragedy for uh, the country and for future generations of the country that, uh, that this has come to pass. Kerry Thornley is someone who pops up in that world. He's a guy who uh, sort of bunked with Oswald in the military and actually wrote a novel about him. Did he come up? I know Garrison was interested in him. Uh, I try, you know, I talked to him once, I think, on the phone. Um, but he was pretty spooky and didn't really want to. He certainly knew him in the Marines. And he did write a book about him in, I don't know, 1960, uh, based a whole, you know, novel around this guy. So, so weird. Uh, Oswald's supposed to be a nobody, but you have, like, J. Yeah. Edgar Hoover interested in him and guys writing novels about him. And... He was, a, like I say, a real enigma. But Hemming actually knew Oswald. He had run into him in 1959, I think, at the uh, Cuban embassy or something. At least he said he did, and you know he probably did. I mean, Hemming was, I mean, was it a, he, he knew a lot of people. He was a soldier of fortune. He was fighting to overthrow Castro. He was a great big guy, six foot six. He's, oh, unbelievable. There were only two, really, that, um, that I absolutely thought I would trust him 100%, and those were Miguel and uh, Antonio Vecchione. This one I know is tricky, but it's like Judith Very Baker. You've come across so many of the witnesses who've come forward and the way that you would have addressed a witness or believed them or not. And you've probably seen enough of her testimony. What do you think? You know, it's obvious that she was at the Riley Coffee Company, but what do you think of her sort of painting this gigantic picture of Lee Oswald? I don't really know. I didn't disbelieve her. I found her actually quite a sincere person. So probably did know him yeah, and may have been his girlfriend. She says she was in New Orleans. Ventura finds her perfectly credible. He thinks that she's, you know, she fills in a lot of the gaps that he'd never been able to fill in before. So maybe he's right. But, she, you know, certainly she's worth uh, listening to and paying attention to and tracking down as much as one can uh, the leads that she, she gives. Do you think that MK Ultra was used in any of these kind of larger political assassinations? I'm thinking about the Robert Kennedy assassination. I would almost bet on it. I would bet on it. That Sirhan was programmed, you know, that he was, he didn't remember what happened. Uh, he didn't fire all those shots. He was given a command from a girl in the polka dot dress. I mean, this is ongoing. There's a potentially a, a case that'll be brought and people have been trying to, uh, but I don't know if he remembers anything. I, mean, I don't think he does. So I don't think you're going to get too far with him except to maybe show that he was programmed and, and, uh, to take part in that assassination. So uh, MK Ultra, then you would consider a very important area of study when you're looking at some of the bigger national assassinations that took place in history. I would. I mean, it could have played a role in the Kennedy assassination, JFK too. I, I, uh, I've thought that. Um, I've looked into things about it. It's too big a subject to go into right now, but sure. there's, there's, uh, there's food for thought there. Well, my last question for you, Dick, and I really appreciate it. It's been a fantastic interview. The, uh, I want to go back to Nagel just real briefly. When you think of him as a person and, you know, the way that he was with you and he opened up somewhat and he shared these amazing things and gave you pieces of a story about Oswald being used as a patsy and being involved in this larger plan around the assassination. What kind of impression do you have of Nagel looking back on him 20, 25 years ago? He was a guy who I think really wanted to come out, come forth, to come clean, as he put it once, you know, to tell everything he knew. And, and yet he was he was trapped. He was, uh, he'd been done all his time in prison. He wanted to stay alive. He had uh, a couple of kids. And uh, I knew that this guy held the key, or a lot of the keys. Mm. I guess the crucial question that comes up uh, regarding the CIA is this. If Oswald was involved, like they tell us he was, what if it was proved that he was one of their agents, as people like Vesiana have gone on record saying that Bishop, who was Atlee Phillips, worked with Oswald? Then it doesn't look good uh, if they make him out to be guilty if he's CIA, right? So I wonder how fast they'd be willing to change that verdict and, you know, calling him the lone assassin if it was proven he was one of their guys. 
So I guess they have set up a bad dynamic for themselves uh, because making him guilty, and if he's a CIA agent... Well, it could well have been, too, that the CIA was using him in other ways. In fact, I think that's true. That that had nothing to do with the assassination. So you had elements of the CIA you know, played off against each other. Maybe you had this small element that hated Kennedy, wanted to get rid of him, put the blame on Castro, have the U.S. get rid of Castro at the same time, and that was one cabal, as it were. Mm-hmm. Then you had this other arm of the CIA that was uh, using Oswald with fair play for Cuba committee stuff, you know, and maybe Phillips was part of that. I don't know. Um, maybe Phillips wasn't this dire conspirator trying to get rid of Kennedy. But then, you know, how's it going to look? I mean, the guy's connected with the CIA, you know, people are going to jump to all kinds of conclusions. So you can't ever let that come out if you're the CIA. So I think that that's quite likely part of this scenario we're talking about. So thank you for shedding light on the dark areas of deep politics and the JFK assassination. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you.